Let's now turn, friends, to the first portion we read <coughs> in Numbers, chapter 21, and uh, verse 9 for a reference this morning. Numbers 21, verse 9. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. <clears throat> now for Moses and the children of Israel, uh, life after Mount Sinai is somewhat difficult for us to trace step by step, at least to do it with any kind of accuracy. You see, days and months and years, they don't feature very highly in God's way of um, dealing with uh, issues in this world. They're not important in his economy, at least not from a particular perspective. Now, we know that these people wandered through this wilderness for 40 years. That's pretty plainly set out for us in the Word of God uh, uh, as they made their way to the Promised Land. But precisely how those years panned out, I find it almost impossible to trace with any accuracy. <coughs> Excuse me. In fact, it can be very confusing the more you try to follow uh, the journey that they took step by step. I know that there are so-called experts who have endeavored to do this and even provided us with maps uh, showing us uh, the route that they, take, they took. Now, I suppose the route is accurate enough in the broadest sense. But remember, this occurred day after day after day after day. And that's the part I find difficult to put together, even in my own mind. Now, if you're going to read um, from Exodus through to Deuteronomy, um, you'll find uh, how confusing this narrative can be. For example, when you read through the book of Leviticus, there's a phenomenal amount of information on the religious life of Israel. But the book of Leviticus covers a very, very short period of time in their lives. Whereas here, in the book of Numbers, from its first chapter to the last one, it covers from 1444 BC to 1405 BC. That's the entire virtually the entire 39 years and they were there for 40 years so it records uh, their departure from Mount Sinai which we have looked at in our study until their arrival in the territory of Moab um, virtually up at the river Jordan now it's not my intention to follow uh, that journey in this study, I think we would find that too tedious. Our main interest hitherto has been to highlight the relevant points from uh, the stage at which they left Egypt in the Exodus down to Mount Sinai. These were the uh, uh, particular uh, sphere of our study, and that's what I was concerned with in the first instance. But there are two or three more incidents which I would like to look at before we leave this study. And they certainly uh, have a lot to uh, teach us and to challenge us with. And uh, this is just one of them, the story of the brazen serpent. So the remaining narrative in the life of this amazing man, Moses, we're going to have to leave. For the present, we may come back, dip into a story now and again, depends on how long 
God leaves me with you as your interim moderator. But over this summer, my time with you is going to be uh, quite limited because we are expecting to have two preachers for uh, prolonged stints with us over the summer months. And that curtails uh, any further long studies on my part. But meanwhile, we shall presently consider this, um, what is to all intents and purposes, a highly unusual stories. A story. Sometimes it's called the story of the brass serpent, sometimes it's called the story of the fiery serpent. And I would suggest to you that it is one of the most mysterious types of our Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Highly mysterious. And we're going to see something of that mystery in the course of this sermon. Now we're going to consider the words, or some of the words we read in John chapter 3 shortly. And strangely, without our Lord's comments on this story, who would ever have guessed that this could possibly typify the crucified Christ of God, a snake of all creatures and of all animals? Indeed, there are few creatures in this world so despised as snakes in every generation. Most people I've ever met, they detest the very thought of ever seeing a snake. And uh, we were, um, as you know, living in Tasmania for 12 years, and they have a lot of snakes in Tasmania, different types of snakes. Every single one of them is poisonous. But strangely, we saw very, very few of them during our time. Now, from the first appearance of a snake in biblical history, and indeed in world history, in the Garden of Eden, every generation thereafter, people have shunned this obnoxious creature. So all the more mysterious why God should ever have used a serpent to typify and illustrate the death of Jesus Christ. And how Jesus himself saw himself in this brass fiery serpent. So let's look first of all then at the context in which we find this story. The journey of the children of Israel, as I've just mentioned, they're in the last phase of their journey to the promised land. And they have covered lots and lots of territory in terms of mileage since they set off from Goshen. They have fought some battles uh, with different types of enemies. They were richly blessed during those years and they were severely chastised. And they buried a huge number of their people in this wilderness desert. Huge number of them. Families, friends. In fact, God promised them because of all their murmuring and their disobedience, this is in Numbers 14, verse 29. Your carcasses, God said, shall fall in this wilderness. Now listen to this. Everyone from 20 years old and upward. That's astonishing. There's 2 million people here. So every, and I take it, it was, uh, it doesn't state this, but I assume it was male adults, every one of them, over 20 years of age, died in the wilderness. Can you imagine the number of graves that these people left behind them in the desert of Sinai? Little wonder that the Bible warns us in the New Testament. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Meanwhile, during those wilderness years, they would, of course, have welcomed many additions to their families. Uh, they habitually had large families, uh, large numbers of children. So during the 40 years, they would have 
um, welcomed many children into the world at the same time. But sadly, they learned so little from God's judgments upon them. <clears throat> he still led them on by the pillar of cloud during the day, by the pillar of fire during the night. He fed them every single day with manna straight from heaven. Constantly, they were experiencing firsthand the kindness and the mercy and the generosity and the love of God. Now, in this context, we read in verse 1 that they were being threatened by the Canaanite army. They fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So once again, they were compelled to call upon God for deliverance and for rescue. And he did. Verse 3, he hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites. However, as they moved on, despite being delivered yet again, the old grumbling and complaining began. Verse 5, there's no bread or water, they said. And listen to this. And our soul loathes this light bread. Verse 5, that's unbelievable. This is bread that came down from heaven and possibly in the hands of angels and fed them with all the nutrients they required. And this is their response. We hate it. I wish I could say to you this morning, there's a one-off. This is, this is utterly unique. There's a one-off. It's the arrogance of those people that made them say, say that they hated what came from the hand of God, the manna from heaven. But my friends, there are people all over the world every single day who say the same thing exactly by the manna of this word. They hate it. Our soul loathes this light bread. It's always been an indication of how deep-rooted sin is in human nature how quickly and how easily men and women, old and young, complain about God. It's no surprise if we hear the world out there complaining about God, even if they don't believe that he exists. I saw something interesting on the internet the other day. It was a statement, and it said, I hate God, even though I don't believe he exists. But you're thinking, well, at least I don't hate God. I never hated God. I used to think like that. Because I don't ever remember saying that I hated God. All right. Let me take some comfort in the fact that I never said that I hated God. But did I grumble? Did I complain about God? What about when providence doesn't work our way? Indeed, when providence kicks us in the face, when things aren't going the way we want to, when our prayers aren't being answered, do we complain then? Do we grumble? Oh, perhaps you're saying, no, nobody's ever heard me grumbling about God. Are you grumbling in here, though? Are you complaining in here, in your heart and in your mind and in your imagination? Oh, you can hide your grumbling from me, and I can hide my grumbling from you. But we cannot hide it from that all-seeing eye, my friends. Even if we don't crumble, even if we don't complain, let's assume that we don't crumble and we don't complain. Are we as thankful as we ought to be for the kindness and the mercy of God day and daily? Are we? Are we any more thankful than these people? Do we thank him first thing in the morning? Do we thank him last thing at night?
No, my friends, I don't think there's a terrible lot of difference between us and these people. We're on the same scale of grumbling and complaining. It's just a question of where on the scale are we? Let me move on to look at God's response to this. Verse 6. The Lord sent fiery serpents, and they bid the people, and many died. Now, these were strange creatures. Notice the word fiery in verse 6. The Lord sent fiery serpents. Commentators tell us that this is a a reference to the uh, sting that accompanied the bite of this particular type of serpent. It felt like a burning sensation. Now, I'm not sure about that. But I do know that the word we have translated here as fiery is the same word that is translated elsewhere in the Bible as seraphim. And you know that a seraphim was a type of angel. Famous reference to it is in Isaiah chapter 6, when the prophet went into the temple and he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and a seraphim came over to Isaiah with a coal, a burning coal in his hand. That's the same word as here. A seraphim. Well, to look at uh, this in a little bit of depth, which I had to do to find out what exactly what this, this was saying, unique to this part of the Sinai wilderness was a unique type of flying snake. Now, we know that such things exist. I remember many years ago, uh, listening and watching, indeed, one of these fascinating nature programs by David Attenborough. And this was before he became such an evolutionist as he is today. He used to produce wonderful um, nature programs. And I remember many years ago watching a program on the, this was the title of, of this particular program, The Flying Snakes of Borneo. Maybe some of you remember seeing that. So there are such a thing as flying snakes. Now, listen to this verse um, referring to flying snakes. Isaiah 14, verse 29. Out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice. I don't know if you know what a cockatrice is. A cockatrice is a strange creature Um, a half-flying creature and half-snaky type of creature. Out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. So these serpents were real, very real, and very deadly. And as they attacked, We read in verse 6, much people of Israel died, and they must have died a most painful death. And I would guess there must have been mayhem, panic, and fear, because there always is when God's judgment falls upon a people. But praise God for his mercy. He delivers people so often from even his own judgments. So here the people pled with Moses in verse 7, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord. And they begged him, take away the serpents from us. This is where we get into difficulty. Because God's answer is difficult. Verse 8, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And then it goes on in verse 9 to tell us that it was a serpent of brass. Now, we have two questions that we have to face here. Why a serpent of all creatures? And why a brass serpent? 
Now, if this miracle was to portray the death of Jesus Christ, as is evident from his own words in John chapter 3, as I asked before, why this obnoxious creature? The creature that played its part in casting all of humanity into spiritual darkness in the Garden of Eden, and worse still, the creature that played its part in exposing God's Son to all the persecution and suffering and forsakenness and even the death which he died at Calvary. Why a serpent? Nevertheless, Moses was commanded, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. Make a brass serpent. And then God promised, every one that is spitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And he repeated, the end of verse 9, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, let's not miss what is being stated here. Let's see what God commanded, what Moses did, and what the people had to do. Moses was told, not only to make a serpent, but to set it upon a pole. Now, at this stage, we don't know what length of pole this was. Meanwhile, the victims were told they had to look up to the serpent. And there they would see this creature molded in shining brass. Now, we can imagine, of course, the relief they felt when they realized that the brass serpent could actually save them or heal them from the serpent's bite. Now, brass uh, first appears in a biblical narrative in Genesis chapter 4. But here's a question. We're here in the middle of a wilderness where did Moses get all that brass from? And this is not the first instance of him using brass. He used a lot of brass in the uh, building of the um, issues of the, of the tabernacle. Lots of aspects of the tabernacle were made of brass. Where did he get that brass from? We can kind of guess when well, Moses, when he built the golden calf, these people were, when they left Goshen, um, Remember, um, there's a phrase, I'm not very really sure I spend much time on it in, in, in the early part of the study or not. But the phrase is, they spoiled Egypt. That is to say, they took out of Egypt as much things like silver, gold, as they possibly remember. Remember, they asked all their neighbors to give them their earrings and all of these things. So we know where the gold for the golden calf came from. But where did this brass come from? It remains something of a mystery to me, my friends. You know, we would have no answer to any of this were it not for our Lord's comments in John chapter 3. And by the way, this is why we should read the whole Bible. Because the Old Testament puts light on some of the things in the New Testament. And the New Testament put lights on the Old Testament. This has always been my objection to the stage uh, uh, at which New Testaments were um, produced, Gallic English New Testaments. And although these were very helpful, they were not the Bible. The Bible is Genesis to Revelation not Matthew to Revelation. And we should always make sure that we are uh, taking on board a balanced reading of the scriptures, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, the more that this story is studied between uh, Numbers 21 and John chapter 3, the more obvious it becomes that Jesus was not merely alluding to an obscure incident 
in the Old Testament, he saw in that brazen serpent a profound prediction on how his own life would end in this world. So let's look in a bit of detail at the message of the serpent. Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. Jesus, um, quoting from this story, has brought your attention to it in John 3, 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And I will come back to that phrase in a moment. Even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. But first of all, let's get back to this question on why brass? There are two references to brass in connection with the biblical imagery of Jesus as the Messiah. The first one is in Daniel chapter 10, verse 6. His feet were like in color to polished brass. And that's repeated in the New Testament, interestingly, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 15, where we have an image of Christ. His feet like fine brass as if burnt in a furnace. Now, we may not know the source from which they got this brass, but we do know the main chemical element of brass. I'm not going to give you a science lesson. I'm not capable of doing that. But the main chemical element of brass is copper. And copper is known for three things. Very interesting and very relevant to the story of our Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. These three things are Copper is known for its flexibility, very flexible component. And secondly, it's known for its conductivity of electrical current. Every cable in your house is made of brass. And even more interestingly, the earth wire from your house into the ground is brass. It's, it's copper, rather. And the third thing, copper is resistant to corrosion. Now, by accident or by design, I'm not sure which. By accident or by design, all three apply to Jesus. Moses, when he took this brass consisting of copper, he could have created any shape he wanted because it was so flexible. But he shaped it into a serpent as God commanded him. God's son is eternally unchanging. <laughs> immutable. But when the fullness of time came, that unchanging son was shaped and molded into humanity. Then, like a brass conductor of electricity or copper, Jesus attracted the destructive power of God's wrath away from you, if you're a believer here this morning, and directed it to himself there on the cross of Calvary. He became the perfect conductor of the wrath of God so that we would never have to experience it. And then thirdly, in this life, and while he lay in the grave, Jesus remained resistant to corruption, just like copper. 
We were singing in uh, Psalm 16. Um, this is quoted in the New Testament in Acts 2.27. Thou will not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. But despite all that he endured, all that he suffered and all that he experienced, he emerged from that grave as pure as the day he was born. No corruption. Now, why a serpent? Well, the scene in the wilderness here is like an illustration from the Garden of Eden. The serpent, as I mentioned earlier on, introduced sin to humanity. And for that, it was cursed by God. God declared, Genesis 3, 14, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed. And that's always God's answer for human sin. A pronounced curse, because the curse is the ultimate expression of God's condemnation. Now, that's the situation facing humanity every single day. All over the world, humanity is under the curse of God. And they'll remain under that curse unless they are delivered through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have in this despairing picture this ray of hope. Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. So in the panic and confusion of God's judgment in the wilderness, this hope was declared. Every one that is bidden, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Now, let's fast forward 1,500 years and discover what this was all about. When Jesus referred to this story and applying it to himself, he was showing us how God redirected that curse away from some of humanity toward himself. To Corinthians chapter 5, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. What a mysterious text of scripture. God took his holy son and made him sin for us who knew no sin. And along with that sin came God's inevitable curse, even upon Jesus Christ. So God took that symbol of original sin and extended its curse first to humanity, then even to Jesus Christ. And God's purpose in all of this was that we, who are born again Christians, might be made the righteousness of God in him. And therein lies the hope of this world, my friends, that this brass serpent representing Jesus Christ might transform our future and our eternal destiny. And one of the most profound texts in all of Scripture is Galatians 3.30. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. It was hard to get one's head around that fact, that God would make his own holy son a curse for any reason. Meanwhile, Jesus didn't merely quote this story from John chapter 3, in John chapter 3, he added something to it. All God told Moses to do was set the serpent upon a pole, Whereas, Jesus told Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, he said, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Lifted up. Notice that phrase. It's easy to miss its significance, my friends. But you know that five times in total, these words appear in the Gospel of John, referring to Jesus. 
twice in John chapter 3 and three times in John chapter 12. Lift it up, lift it up, lift it up. So the New Testament fulfillment of this brazen serpent wasn't merely in Jesus being nailed to the cross, but in lifting him up before a condemned and cursed humanity. And in every age and every generation, there is only one escape, my friends, from God's wrath and curse. It is what the Bible calls Christ being lifted up. And this is what the gospel is about. This is what Christian witness is about. This is what Christian preaching should be about. Lifting up Christ as I am trying to lift him up before you here this Sabbath morning. And we are to do that for two reasons, my friends. First of all, we are to do it to demonstrate God's answer to human sin and condemnation. Because without the crucified Christ, humanity remains under God's curse forever. And the second reason is to present Christ crucified in gospel preaching and in Christian witness, because that's the common way that God saves sinners. Christian witness, gospel preaching, focusing on the crucified Christ of God being lifted up. Now, one of the reasons why that phrase is so essential to the gospel is, and we're quoting somebody else here, when Christ was lifted up, he was lifted up literally and physically from the earth that didn't want him. But he was not received into heaven because heaven wasn't ready to receive him. In other words, he was lifted up to be suspended in a spiritual no man's land, enduring the curse of God upon himself, so that I, a sinner that has been unable to repent of my sins by the grace of God, could stand here this morning and say, I'm a saved sinner, saved by the grace of Christ. So let me quote to you as I conclude the words of Jesus in John 12, 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And when we read some of the words in the Old Testament, we have to remember that we are reading actually the words of Jesus Christ. And you'll find these words in Isaiah 45. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all ends of the earth. Look unto me, the Christ was lifted up on the cross of Calvary. And that, my friends, is the gospel in a nutshell, summed up in these words. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Now, some of you here this morning, you have experienced this drawing power from the Christ who was lifted up. Oh, my prayer is that you will all feel it and all experience it and all praise God that you were drawn to the Christ who was lifted up on the cross of Calvary. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we thank thee that we are able to understand something of the mystery of godliness set out for us in the gospel story. We thank thee that Jesus was indeed lifted up, that he became the fulfillment of the brazen, fiery serpent of Moses' story, and that he demonstrated to us and continues to demonstrate 
that he still is the only cure for God's condemnation and curse. Oh, grant us all, Lord, that we would embrace him as our Saviour, as our Lord, and as our God, that we would walk with him in what remains of our lives on this earth, and that he would embrace us with his everlasting arms. For Jesus' sake. Amen. It's time to receive the benediction. <laughs> now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.